The air was so hot and stagnant, it was difficult to breathe. I lay perfectly still in an effort to avoid any exertion which might have made it worse. It was one of those sticky, humid days that never seems to end. Half dressed and face down on my bed, I was drifting in and out of consciousness. I felt her soft finger tracing a line along my back as she whispered loving words to me. I sank deeper into the gentle embrace of sleep's cool darkness. I dreamt of being held, touched, and loved. At some point, I awoke in a disoriented fog. As I struggled to get my bearings, I felt her fingers gently touch my arm and I closed my eyes again. It felt like a moment, but it could have been an hour or maybe more when a loud noise jarred me awake. Instinct took over and I was on my feet in an instant, ready to defend myself. Reality was slow to join me, but caught up a moment later and I realized where I was. The smashing echoes of steel on steel seamlessly blended in with angry screaming voices. The cacophony of noise was the prison's endlessly cruel heartbeat. A sense of hopeless depression enveloped me. Only a moment ago I had been in one of those deliciously pleasureful dreams that felt so real it hurt to wake up. The swarming sense of loss surrounded me and pushed me back onto the unforgiving steel bunk as I realized I wasn't with my wife. It had been years since I'd heard from her, seen her, or been touched by her. I closed my eyes and strained to get back to that wispy dream reprieve, back to my favorite alternate universe, back to sleep. I lay perfectly still, trying to tune out the metal slamming on metal, the barked orders, the hopeless pleas, and the angry I'd been practicing meditation in prison for over a decade and had some ability to separate myself from my surroundings. Finding peace in the big house uh, is a useful skill to acquire, but forgetting where you are isn't recommended as it can be dangerous in here. I calmed my racing heart while my mind tried to disengage from the cell block. At some point I drifted into my alternate reality and again I felt her gentle touch on my cheek and then my lip. I wanted to retreat into her loving arms. Her touch was feather light and it tickled me. I shuddered involuntarily and she was gone. I closed my eyes again and soon she was back with me. I wanted her to hold me but she never did. The food slot slammed open and a tray of food was shoved in. I was back in the real world. I got up and looked at the tray with resignation. A warm cup of brownish liquid they called coffee, two slices of bread, a scoop of mashed potato, and soggy overcooked green beans with a slice of bologna and a single packet of mustard. I keep telling the food steward I'm a vegan. I don't eat animal products, but he doesn't listen and they just don't care. So sitting next to the toilet, I ate my cold mashed potato sandwich with mushy beans and washed it down with the coffee. I placed my tray on the food slot and a few moments later, it was pulled out and the slot slammed shut. I heard the guard yelling at someone to return the food tray. I lie down and try to block out the sounds. The dispute is one I've heard a thousand times before and it permeates the atmosphere. It echoes in my cell and sinks uncomfortably into my teeth feels like chewing tinfoil. I hate hearing these recurrent provocations that flow back and forth so easily from guards and prisoners. Abusive accusations, recriminations, and insult leap out at each other effortlessly and thoughtlessly, with no human regard for the other, each justified in their own positions and never able to see the other's point of view. I try to get back to my wife, but I can't get past the iron door, and the more I try, the further away she becomes. I yearned to drift across the universe to that distant land, but the border crossings closed. I just can't find sleep. So I sit on the floor with my back to the wall, hoping to absorb some of the coolness from the steel walls and cement floor, but to no avail. So I just sit in the sweltering heat, swimming in my sweat and filth. Showers here at the Hotel California are twice a week, if you get lucky. The guard bangs on the cell door and asks if I want to go to yard. I say no without thinking. Yard is a small asphalt enclosure with high concrete walls. The sun never shines into the yard, but if you look up past the chain link fence, the razor wire that spans wall to wall like a porous steel roof, you can see the sky. 
maybe a cloud or two, and occasionally you might even see a bird fly by. No, I wanted to spend some time in the clouds, but with my wife. So I closed my eyes and tried to disengage from reality. The time dragged by and it seemed like I was still in the prison, but somehow I felt her fingers on my leg. Shocked and excited, I opened my eyes, only to realize it was a fly walking on me. I was greedy for human touch, so I closed my eyes and pretended it was her fingers. I tried to stay perfectly still because I didn't want to frighten the fly off and be left alone. As I sat there, the fly took off and landed on my shoulder. I noticed I was breathing shallowly, as shallowly as I could in an effort not to disturb the fly. On some level, I realized that this may be considered by the officials, or almost anyone, as strange behavior, but I didn't care what they might think. The world was so far away that uh, nothing mattered. I remember wondering if I should be concerned about diminishing mental capacity. I had read that long-term isolation was bad for mental health. I surmised that simulated human touch was better than none. As I share this story now, I realize that this may be the first recorded symbiotic relationship between a fly and a human. The fly was getting nourishment from the salts and minerals in my sweat in exchange for allowing me to enhance my dreams with simulated human touch and thereby possibly avoid isolation-induced correctional dementia. I found myself trying to stay very still so I wouldn't frighten the fly away. Whenever I was let out of my cell, I would try to catch more flies and bring them back to my cell, my eyes constantly scanning for flies. No matter what I was doing, if a fly landed on me, I would instantly become still and let them walk around. From time to time, my limited landscape was void of any flies, and whenever there were no flies to accompany me, I felt prison's loneliness more profoundly. I've heard of people becoming more susceptible to depression during the winter months due to a lack of sunshine, but it appears I had a completely different reason. One day, while time was whittling my life away, I felt a sharp pain, and I noticed a fly was on top of a cut on my arm. I waved the fly away, but it came right back to the cut again. After several waves, I realized the fly was very interested in the blood from the cut. I knew that it was probably a bad idea to let a fly walk around drinking from a cut, so I covered the cut with a piece of sticky tape from an envelope. The fly continued to look for the cut, but couldn't find it. As a result, I got the idea to bite my cheek and mix the saliva with blood, and then spread the mixture on the inside of my forearm, as the skin there was more sensitive. The fly was very interested in this and spent a great deal of time walking around on my inner forearm, seeking the source. I spread some of the mixture on the sensitive area of my neck. This unconventional relationship has gone on for decades, and while I can't recall how many flies have kept me company throughout my incarceration, I can say I appreciated the moments that they allowed me to dream that I was somewhere else with someone I loved.